Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I guess it's afternoon, exactly noon. Um, I'm going to do a few introductory uh, comments and give people a few minutes to find their way onto this webinar. Uh, my name is Karen Swirsky. I'm a member of the Building a Better Ben board. I um, This is our second virtual lecture, and I hope that you all had a chance to watch our previous virtual talk, which was on October 20th, called Streets for Living, how the public realm can transform Ben's growth from good to great. It was really good and I highly recommend it. One of the benefits of being electronic is that um, we can record our lectures. So if you go to our website, buildingabetterben.org, you can watch that uh, webinar. Is really work really good. So, what is Building a Better Bend? Um, we are a nonprofit group of folks who are basically just curious about today's issues in planning and development. Um, for about 15 years, we've been satisfying our curiosity by inviting people who know more than we do to come in and tell us about what we're curious about. So, we find, invite, and host um, experts. Uh, who share their experiences with us in ways that we maybe be able to use to have a positive impact on the quality of development and growth in our region. Today's lecture is sponsored by Pinnacle Engineering and also by Kittleson and Associates, so we thank you for that. Today's topic is of particular interest to me because I am a transportation and land use planner. And as we all know, about eight months ago, everything changed and really suddenly. We are working from home, we're traveling less, we're wearing masks and we're living virtually. I'm kind of actually surprised at how quickly we adapted, but I am curious about the consequences. Are any of these change permanent? Are any of them good? Um, will we go back to the old way as soon as we can? Um, and what have we learned that might change how we go forward in the coming months and years? So about a month or so ago, I got a newsletter from Kittleson and Associates. That's a transportation planning and engineering firm that's evidently just about as full of curious people as Bend because they were looking at the data and they were wondering the same things. And it seemed like a perfect topic for building a better Bend. Um, Will COVID-19 permanently alter teleworking and commuting patterns? And what does that mean? So we asked them to come and share their data and thoughts with us today. Um, the lecture is formatted with some poll questions embedded in them. And then at the end, we'll have, um, there's some other suggestions for discussion. And at the end, we'll hopefully have time for some questions that I will be forwarding to the speakers. And they also, both the speakers are willing to continue to answer some questions uh, electronically after, uh, through email after the lecture is over. Um, so our speakers today are Matt Kittleson and Jorge Barrios. They are both from Kittleson and Associates. Kittleson and Associates has a nice motto. They say it's called transforming how communities move. We solve complex transportation problems to improve everyday people's everyday lives. They have offices all the way across the United States. They work collaborative collaboratively together on all kinds of projects, including things like hurricane evacuation route planning, roundabout guidelines, and redesigning roadways in big cities like Phoenix. We have two speakers today. We have Matt Kettleson. His last name is not a coincidence. Um, Matt is a senior planner in Kittleson's Bend office, and he's been here uh, living and working in Central Oregon since 2010. Over that time, he's worked on a variety of transportation planning and operations studies, um, including updating transportation systems plans for communities of Madras, Sisters, Lapine, and Remnant, and most recently was the consultant lead on Bend's transportation plan. Some of you may have gotten to know him through that. And he helped with the successful general obligation bond measure that just passed on our recent election. He enjoys creating community given, driven planning efforts that are tailored to the unique um, identity of each place. Jorge um, is an associate planner, excuse me, associate engineer, though he calls himself, you're gonna have to explain the word Jorge, a combination of planner engineer. 
with Kittleson and he um, likes puns because he says that he enjoys working at the intersection of transport and land use. He leads Kittleson's data analytics process and is always looking for ways to use data to answer his clients' burning questions. And two questions he's been hearing a lot recently are the ones we are asking, how is COVID-19 impacting mobility? And how will COVID-19 change transportation and land use patterns in the years to come? He'll be sharing um, some data that will help answer those questions. And now I will turn it over to Matt Kittleson. Thanks, Karen. And thanks everyone for coming. I'm gonna get our presentation up as we are, as I'm doing this here. <clears throat> Um, but um, this, is a, this is a fun topic for us to talk about. It's one that is a topic in process. So it's evolving and we're learning more about it as we go. So it's, it's something where if we had this presentation in a couple months, we may, we may have something different to share because as Karen said, it's happening so fast and things are changing so fast. So today, what we're going to do is talk about a couple things, two major topics. One, what's the data telling us about COVID-19 and what it's doing to our travel? Where did it, how did it impact us to begin with and how have we recovered? <clears throat> and also what are people telling us about how the, this change in data and change in, in um, situation for folks, uh, how may it impact their travel patterns and as, as it is occurring today. And also as we get back to what we'll call normal whenever that occurs. So as Carrie mentioned, we'll have some polls throughout. So be ready to provide your input. And we're also, as a, as a way of seeding discussion and question and answer, we'll have some prompts for you to share your thoughts along the way. And what's intended there is to, as we're thinking about things, add your comments or your questions, and we'll come back to those at the end, but we'll, we'll pose those throughout to try to, to create a pretty hearty discussion when we get to the end of it. So. With that, I'll turn it over to Jorge to talk about some of the initial data uh, elements we want to share with you. Thank you, Matt. I am not seeing your screen. Are, did you mean to share that? Oh, I think I need a click share. There we go. Cool. Well, thank you. And thank you, Karen, for the nice introduction. Um, so I'll start by setting the stage about what has been happening over the past six, seven, eight months with regards to data on travel patterns, uh, transit ridership, and uh, internet service. So if you will, next slide, please. Cool, so one of the websites I've been using a lot is called tracktherecovery.org. They are compiling, um, they're compiling cell phone data from many different uh, services. They're compiling credit card processors, um, payroll and, kind of paycheck processing companies data as well to try to give some real time insights on what's happening with, uh, with travel, employment, economics, and all these things. I really recommend you guys check that out. It is freely available. Uh, so one of the data sets that we've pulled for this is the time spent outside the home. And this is coming from Google cell phone location data. Uh, so there's a couple of lines here that are pretty interesting. I'll focus on those. First, the, the green line at the top, that represents grocery trips. Um, and you can see that that uh, spiked upward at the beginning of the pandemic in, in early March to be about, I wanna say about 20% higher than January, 2020, which is the baseline in all of these charts. So you'll hear me say that that often. Um, as you guys probably know, that related to a lot of kind of panic grocery shopping that people were doing, make sure they were stocked up. Um, after that happened in late March, April, uh, the trips to grocery stores did come down in the Schultz County to be about 20% lower than January of 2020. Uh, since then, it has recovered pretty steadily. And as of early November, it was roughly where it was back in January 2020. So grocery stores, I think on the whole in the Schultz County haven't seen uh, too much of a drop off. Now, work trips, on the other hand, that's the red line at the bottom. They didn't have an uptick early on. They just, they just dropped very quickly through the second half of March, and they were down 45 50% from their usual levels. And the recovery so far, I think it's, it's uh, you can divide it in two stages. So as so you can see, from about April 1st to June 1st, it was a 
pretty steady and um, and rapid recovery. Uh, so when it came back up to only about 25% lower than January 2020, but it's flattened out since June. Uh, and that corresponds to when that second wave of cases came in across, across most of the country. Uh, so um, work trips are still uh, significantly down from where they were at the beginning of the year. Next slide. Uh, as you can imagine, the a big reason why there's fewer work trips is that there are fewer jobs out there. Now, um, the Opportunity Insights track the recovery.org does a pretty cool thing, and it's to break up the jobs by, by wage level. So the red and green line representing high and medium wage jobs, you can see that they've pretty much recovered to January 2020 levels already. But the low wage jobs, they came down through that shelter in place period and they've pretty much stayed down, even declining a little bit further. So now you have about 35% fewer lower wage jobs in Oregon than you had at the beginning of the year. So it's a pretty, pretty crazy discrepancy between uh, your medium and high wage jobs where you could perhaps telework more easily and those lower wage jobs where it may not be as common. Next slide. A similar picture with uh, small businesses open. So this is another data set. They uh, basically track credit card transactions and can tell when a small business has stopped taking in transactions and they can assume that it's since been closed. Uh, a huge wave of closures in March uh, and early April uh, resulted in having 30 to 50% fewer smaller businesses open in Oregon. Uh, that has recovered a little bit, but, but not too much. You can still see a pretty big decline in um, small businesses from 18% in the retail and transportation sector, 28% in education and health, and the biggest decrease, uh, as you guys can imagine, leisure and hospitality down 35% from January 2020 levels. Next slide. One more free data set as well that we've been tracking is trips per day. So this is put out by the US DOT and it relies again on cell phone location data. And instead of counting traffic volumes or transit trips, it's trying to say how many trips from A to B are people doing on, on a daily basis. Uh, so this data here is for the Schutz County and it shows the evolution of trips per day through 2019 and 2020. The numbers are not in the slide, but I looked at October 2020 versus October 2019, so a year difference. And there's a 54% decrease in daily trips in the Schutz County. So uh, basically half of the trips that would normally happen are happening these days. And I think that um, intersects pretty well with what Matt will talk later on about how that's reflected in traffic volumes. Um, and you will see that this decrease of, of 54% through October is larger than what we're seeing with car traffic. So it tells us that um, that there's there's some car trips out there that are not giving you as much bang for the buck when it comes to getting people from A to B. Next slide. Another mode that's seen a, a, a lot of decrease is transit ridership. So we got this data from the National Transit Database. Uh, it publishes ridership data for all transit agencies in the country. This is for the Bend metropolitan region, and it's showing a, a pretty steep decrease in transit riderships as you get into February and March. So again, the numbers are not shown in the slide, but for June 2020, which was uh, the latest that I had when I, when I pulled this, uh, we're seeing an 80% decrease in uh, bus ridership in the Bend, Oregon, in, yeah, the Bend, Oregon metropolitan area. Um, so I, I, again, that was June. So that's kind of the, the height of shelter in place. Still things pretty shut down. If we look at um, January through August, the Bend region is on track for about 46% fewer transit riders in the year. So next slide, we have a discussion point here. Just some open questions for you guys to think about and maybe type in the chat if something comes to mind. We're obviously seeing a lot of uh, challenges with transit as the ridership story tells. Um, we wanna get your take on how do you think that 
that will change as COVID becomes less of a threat in, in the near future um, and what transit agencies could do in the meantime. So we can, we can go back um, at the end of the presentation and expand on this. Next slide. And so before I turn it over to Matt to talk about Zoom towns, um, I thought it would be relevant to show this FCC data set on the number of high-speed internet providers. Um, I pulled data for the, the nine most populous counties in Oregon. And unfortunately, you can see that the Schutz County is near the bottom when it comes to having uh, high-speed internet providers. So about a little more than half of residents in the Schutz County don't really have a choice when it comes to a really high-speed broadband internet provider. They either have zero or just one provider. Obviously, the, the more providers you have, in theory, you would expect better service, lower prices, and more access. Uh, so there's still some roof, room for improvement there for the Schutz County. So over to you, Matt. We'll get off that side quick because there's nothing that invokes more passion than internet providers, especially when you have multiple Zoom calls happening from the same house, which may or may not be happening in my house right now. So, um, so Jorge mentioned Zoom Town, um, and this is a, 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 a term that popped up recently. Some of you may be familiar with this graphic here. Um, this is released by the, the economic agencies in, in Oregon tracking what, what's happening with, with where people are moving to. Um, and so what this graph on the right shows us is that Bend, Truckee, Missoula, Montana, places that are nice to live and visit are places that people are moving right now. That's something that's anecdotal for a lot of people, maybe not so anecdotal for others, but something that's been real and happening in Bend over this year as people decide where they want to live. So we're gonna talk about that a lot, about why that's happening and what it means for the future of our transportation system. Um, there was a, a popular article a month or two ago that, that made a lot of news that identified Bend as the second fastest growing city in the US. That's occurring now. It's of course something that we're familiar with here. We often make these lists. It, it seems to be gasoline on the fire a little bit right now in terms of the pressures that are occurring with people coming here. Development applications are keeping pace, if not expanding where they were in previous years. I was talking with Russ Brayson at the city and he has a whole chart about how how they're tracking this and everything is has not slowed down at all through this pandemic. There's just as much pressure for development to occur in town. Um, and again, home sales are up 15% through September from where they were a year ago. So common themes, but the root cause of this is different than it was in the past as Bend has grown. Um, and we'll explore what that means for us. And one of the key elements, again, this is a discussion for you to think about, add some questions, and we'll come back to when we get to the end of it, is people are moving to Bend because they have flexibility in where they're working from. Someone's job may be in Portland or Seattle or San Francisco, but they're choosing to live in Bend. Obviously, that's not everyone's uh, ability to choose. Not everyone can choose where they live in their needs associated with living and working are different than someone who can work out of their living room in perpetuity. Someone still needs to get to work. They still need to use transit. So a question for, for the group to think about and pose questions around is, how do we maintain equity for people that are more dependent upon the transportation system for their economic viability? Um, if you can't work from home, if you have to go to your place of employment to work, if you can't choose to live in Missoula, Montana, and and work somewhere else, your, your needs are different. So that's a key question. We don't necessarily have an answer for that yet, but we're starting to understand the implications of it and we'd be curious your thoughts on that as well. So next I'm gonna go into some data um, of what's happened in Bend um, immediately after the pandemic and then more recently. And I'll, I'll give a thanks out of the gate to the Bend MPO and specifically Toby Anderson there um, for providing this data. If you're in, in need of traffic data, uh, it locally, she is your person to talk to. She has a lot of great data um, and provided this for, for us to talk about today. 
So what I'm going to show you um, first is this is Colorado Avenue, a comparison of where we were in April, which is probably not terribly surprising. So immediately after the pandemic set hold and and all the closures were in place, what we saw was right at the Colorado Bridge, a, about a 54 percent drop in demand across across the board. Um, you can see the time of day drops were pretty significant. And we didn't even we weren't even approaching anything remotely what it was like under a typical day in April that we would all come to expect. The same at Galveston. So we'll compare Galveston and Colorado. Um, you can see before we had a, a, an, a morning peak, we had an afternoon evening peak, and that just wasn't occurring. It was totally flat um, for the most part. You really weren't reaching those peaks. We maybe saw the a little bit of a peak of people doing those uh, increase in shopping trips, you know, where there's a totally different travel pattern that was occurring. But really, it was it was a ghost town driving around compared to what we would typically expect. Fast forwarding now, as we get back to uh, into September, we're starting to see more people traveling around. There's people with places to go. You've probably been around town and experienced congestion in places that you had experienced it before. But what's been interesting for us, and I'm I'm interested in tracking as we move forward, is as you can see the blue line um, from September of 2019 and the orange line from this most recent September, we're starting to get back to the same levels, but the peaks are totally different. In particular, if you look at the AM, we don't have an AM peak right now. We're really building, at least in this in this Colorado example, we're building over the course of the day. Now, why is that? Probably school, a huge impact associated with people not going to and from school. They're not linking trips, dropping off a kid and then going to, um, to go shop or go to work afterwards. So does that recover or does it not? And the same true later in the day, we're not seeing the really sharp evening peak. We're seeing really a kind of a flat rise over time. And then that drops off, uh, you know, about the same time, at least in the Colorado example. So things to look at is, do we develop these peaks again? Are we, or is, is travel patterns where we're reducing the commute in and out of work? Do we just see um, a more of a flat congestion throughout the day where people are traveling around different, different ways? So when you think about traffic data, and this is something I've been having a lot of discussions with over the last several months, it's a question of, well, is our average daily traffic back? Are we back to where we were before? And I think that's an interesting question, but how people are traveling and why they're traveling is just as much of a question because we can see different demands on the system as those trips overlap with each other. And that's something to really keep in track of uh, and um, in track because the solution to traffic with the, these shapes being different is a potentially a different answer. We could end up having different needs or, or maybe not as many or a different priority of needs. So this is something we'll really need to be keeping an eye on. Uh, and the same is true at Galveston. We see that same lack of a morning peak, pretty sharply different in this case. Um, and also notably here, you can see before we saw, we started seeing the drop off closer to 6 p.m., kind of building up to 6 p.m., 5, 6 o'clock, and then, and then having the, the demand drop off. Now we're seeing that drop off, at least you know, with current data, happening much earlier in the day. Four o'clock, the demand starts dropping off. That's actually the highest volume we saw. So does this hold true or not? But you start seeing the shape of this curve matters a lot. It has a big impact on, on, on what it means for congestion or what, or, or what it doesn't. Um, and again, this is interesting. It's only vehicles. So it's an easy thing for us to track and report. There's a totally different story that we'll get into as it relates to people walking, biking. Um, Jorge mentioned transit a little bit. But there's a lot of moving parts to how people are, are getting around town um, and something um, very important for us to, to keep track of and learn from as we move forward. Um, so question here is, you know, what does this mean as these patterns continue to change? What does it mean for Bend as we grow, dealing with growth? Are the, are the answers to growth different? Um, are they the same? Um, is our timing different? Um, ben has some unique opportunities here um, going forward. Obviously, the Go Bond, which Karen mentioned, we'll talk about that a, bit, a little bit more later. Um, but certainly, opportunities and curious your inputs on on your anecdotes or or your observations of what does this mean for 
for us as we're dealing with growth. So now we'll first uh, do our first poll and curious your example. Um, as you travel patterns now, are they the same as they were pre-COVID? Um, options, yes, they're the same, they never changed. Yes, they're back to normal um, after some change. No, they're not back, they no, they're not the same, I travel less, or no, I travel more. In Valerie, I think I am, am I supposed to do the poll or are you doing the poll? I forget what we ended up on. I think you can launch the poll. Where do I do if, that? If not, I can launch it. I don't see it. So okay, I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so can we, are they, are people seeing the poll results? Yes, they should be able to see this. Okay, so it looks like overwhelmingly people are saying um, they're not the same, we are traveling less. So that would support the data we're seeing. and. Um, you know, with your own experience, I guess that's it's in a, a good thing to think about of how does that how does that impact what we do with the transportation system. So keep in moving here. School in particular, this is a, an open ended one. Um, I have a first grader at home right now and a kindergarten teacher also with me. So our daily trips are a lot different with, in my own household with how we're getting to and from school. Um, so thinking ahead about reopening, because certainly the school closure has a big impact on, on trips around the system. Um, as schools open and we're going back, will people drop off their kids more? Bend already has a high rate of drop off for students, particularly in the lower grades. Does that increase? Um, if you drop off your student, will you just continue on to work since you're already out and about? I think that's something that's, that's um, interesting. On the school site specifically, if we have a real increase in drop-offs, do, do we have the infrastructure to support it? That may be a really a, a sharper peak than we noticed before if everyone's being dropped off at the same time in a rate we haven't seen before. So certainly lots of questions around school, site-specific, but then also throughout um, the busing question at schools. You know, we saw the drop-off with transit. Does that still, does that rear its head with schools themselves? So lots of questions here. And another poll around this just, um, I'm curious as much as anything from our perspective of kids you know, whether they be your own or somebody else's, maybe grandkids or neighbors, friends, kids, do you think their mode of travel to school changes after schools open? So if they're riding the bus, are they not riding the bus now um, or is it staying the same? Hey, Matt, this is Karen. We had a question that you might be able to answer, or maybe Valerie can, about the polls when it's closed, how many people voted? I can't see it, but Valerie may be able to see it. Yeah, I thought if she could, it would be interesting. This is 80% of the participation. Yeah, and there are numbers next to the responses so we can see. Oh yeah, there it is. Um, so it looks like in this case, we don't know. Um, a lot of undecided, but for the people that do know, maybe keeping things the same way as they were before. Um, so just a, a, a parting local takeaway um, and, and I'll transition over back to, to Jorge's thoughts. Um, you know, we have a lot of new residents coming. Certainly that's, that's true but they might not have a local office to work from. If that's the reason they're coming is flexibility and work. Um, a large percentage of them may not, may not have an office to go to. That may have a big impact on travel patterns. We've historically had a very high rate of people working from home for probably similar reasons to what's bringing people here now, nine to 12% historically. Um, so as that, as that changes, um, 
we may see infrastructure needs change in, in, in conjunction with it. It may be a delaying of, of need for capacity improvements we are expecting over a certain period of time. So definitely something to keep track of and track um, and something we're gonna need to learn from as we learn the situation better. Um, so again, a question for the group of, you know, are, do you think the timing is gonna change significantly? Is the infrastructure needs themselves going to change? That's something as a community we need to be aware of and thinking about. Um, and curious your thoughts and questions on those topics. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jorge to talk uh, more specifically about what we heard from commuters uh, on this topic and how, how they might alter their, their traveling patterns after the pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And this may be the uh, newsletter that Karen was referencing at the beginning of the call. Um, so we, we've had these questions for a while on, on how things will change uh, through the pandemic and immediately after the pandemic. So at the beginning of this year, uh, roughly like March, April, once the pandemic hit, we figured out that we needed to conduct a state of preference survey to be able to answer any of these questions. Um, and so next slide, Matt. So we are able to use our network of friends and family and our listservs to survey a thousand commuters between May 14th and July 6th, 6th of 2020. So in the height of that shelter in place uh, time period, uh, those respondents came from 28 different industries and pretty much across the entire US. But um, I will caveat that because it was through our network of friends and family, a lot of responses are coming from people in the transportation field or other uh, professional industries. Next slide. So the uh, very first question we ask people is that if it were up to you, how would you prefer to work from home moving forward? So kind of post post pandemic restrictions, we were pretty surprised to see lots of interest, um, even for um, all all time. So full time telecommuting, but also for a very frequent two to three times a week uh, telecommuting uh, only four. 14% of respondents said that they would not like to telecommute going forward. Um, so uh, definitely a much bigger number than we expected. And it tells you that people have generally liked the experience of telecommuting and would be happy to do it pretty often. Next slide. The flip side of this is whether employers would be willing to accommodate that telecommuting, right? So it, it doesn't help if you, if you want it, but your employer doesn't let you, then chances are it's not going to happen. So it's when those two things really overlap that you can get to, to hire work from home uh, mode shares. So, and again, this I think we lost your volume. Your so it's just me. Oh. oh. Yeah, I'm um, showing up a, a loud here. Cool. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so, we heard from about three quarters of respondents that their employers would be either willing or very, very willing to accommodate telecommuting. Only 8% said that their employer would be, would be very unwilling to do it. So uh, it seems that those things, both kind of on the employee side, the one to telecommute and the employer uh, accommodation seem to be lining up uh, and could result in higher work from home mode shares in the future. Next slide. Another uh, key part of our survey was trying to figure out the modes that people would take uh, when they do physically commute to the office. So kind of the same question that Matt was posing about uh, kids going to school. So in our survey, we heard that 22% of people plan to change their mode of transportation when they, when they commute to their physical spaces. May not seem like a lot, but, but in reality, it's, it's very hard for people to reconsider their commute mode. It's not something you wake up, you know, every day and, and sort out. This is something that you kind of build into your routine. You either drive to work, take transit or bike, uh, you know, on a pretty consistent basis. So for about a fifth of commuters to rethink it all at once, I think um, it's pretty rare and it um, can bring up opportunities and challenges for cities, MPOs and counties to really advance their goals uh, through this change. Next slide. Speaking of uh, modes that people take, uh, so putting those answers together about how they got to work before the pandemic and what they're planning to do, here's what we're expecting based on those uh, survey responses. The auto mode, uh, 
is expected to go up by a little bit from 66% to 70% of respondents. Uh, transit, uh, a lot of people were, were thinking of, of switching out of transit once the pandemic uh, was over. So from 20% to 11% and walking going up from 14 to 19. Uh, so off the bat, you'll see these numbers for transit and walking and biking are, are higher than what Matt showed uh, for Ben. And again, this probably speaks to our sample of, of transportation and uh, engineers and planners. But uh, th these are kind of the broad changes that we're seeing. And next slide. So with that, we'll close out with another discussion point. Uh, so how do we create transportation options to provide the choices that people need? And over to you, Matt. And with that, also um, curious, a, a little mini survey of the same idea. Um, so a poll Valerie will put up of during this COVID-19, has your travel mode to work changed? Um, no, and then yes, um, with various options of drive more, bike more, ride transit more, or I work from home more. So it looks like most people, a little more than half, are working from home more, which is probably not surprising. But um, when you think back to those graphics that we saw before, it's definitely have an impact on the type of travel we're seeing. Um, so, so where do we go from here? Is Bend ready for this? Um, and a couple highlights that I want to um, point to. One that a lot of people here are familiar with, maybe both of these, is Bend recently adopted, as Karen mentioned, a transportation system plan, which is the outcome of a, a long process for um, planning and thinking about what type of infrastructure needs Ben needs in the future, what type of um, uh, facilities we should be planning. There's a number of, of roadway projects, there's a number of walking, biking projects, some um, in transit infrastructure, lots of, of planned projects and programs are in that document, policies to support them. Um, and anyone familiar with that process knows that the outcome is intended to be uh, a guidance document for the community, but also something that is flexible, that needs to, you need to think about the, the timing of needs. So although we just adopted a transportation system plan, we need to continue to think about what are those needs? What are, do we still have the same given the changing situation, do we still have the right projects and programs is the, is the order of them that we were thinking right. Um, and the same, uh, along the same lines, Cascades East Transit just uh, adopted their own transit development plan that is for the whole region, including Bend. Um, there's a, a lot of paradigm shifts type projects in that plan. We're moving away from a hub and spoke system into uh, a more of a dispersed routes with mobility hubs included, um, with mobility hubs being smaller scale transit facilities, potentially coupled with ride sharing, scooter sharing, you know, a lot of stuff to be determined on how those might operate and work. But a lot these plans really, I think, set a nice framework for, for having the discussion to, to using them as, as useful tools as we move forward with, with thinking about what we need when this pandemic's over and what we're learning from it. So these are useful documents. Uh, to, to start us off there. Also, um, we just passed a geo bond in Bend, and a lot of people here are very, very familiar with that. But what that means is there's $190 million of projects that have been identified that are needed over the next 10 years that include projects to address congestion, to create a really robust walking and biking route network, including low stress facilities for people to remove them from the roads. And as I mentioned, mobility hub investment, partnering with the city and the transit agency to start building these smaller scale hubs that help people transition between modes, whether they be walking and ke catching a bus or riding a scooter and catching a ride share, something like that. So this, the bond presents a lot of opportunities. It presents dollars to help start implementing these projects that we know about. Um, I know one of the things the city is gonna immediately have to start thinking is which projects go first. and 
is does this pandemic help us understand that a little bit better in terms of what type of infrastructure needs are needed sooner than others as we see travel patterns change and demands potentially change on the system, maybe decreasing some places and increasing others. So certainly not a bad time to have opportunity on deciding where we make investments, but nonetheless still a, an important discussion and question that we have in front of us. Um, so um, we have these discussion topics here. I think I'm actually, before we, we, we linger on this and have a discussion, I wanna go to our last slide, which is where do we go from here? Um, and I think the, a key takeaway that I'm seeing is, and I think this is in the comments already, is we're not done with this yet. We're not back to normal. We don't know exactly what normal is going to be. So this is not the time to, to look at the data and make absolute decisions on what it's telling us. We're gonna have to continue to watch and learn about how people are reacting and changing based on the situations in front of them. So we're learning, but more to learn as we go through this and, and the, the, the months and years go on from here. Also, it's, it's always true, but I think especially true now is we need to listen to the community to hear how do people wanna travel? What are their needs? Are those changing? Uh, this is a, a real opportunity in the transportation world to I think, take advantage of some of the tendencies that, that Jorge highlighted to say, you know, maybe there is a, a willingness to participate in a different mode of travel more than there was before. Maybe there's a, a need that's better met by a different mode of travel than there was before. I don't think we expected to be on as many Zoom calls as we were. There's been some benefits on the public engagement side that we weren't expecting uh, as an outcome of this pandemic. Um, so maybe the same is true on the transportation infrastructure side. We could see different needs and planning that result from here. And ultimately, I think we need to be flexible. We need to think about things um, in, a, in changing ways. We need to be responsive to what we're learning, accept new information and, and use it in useful ways and really be nimble as we move forward with planning and, and, um, and working through these next, the, the future that's ahead of us as we, as we get back to normal and, and continue to try to help people get to where they need to go efficiently, safely um, and with choices. So with that, I'm going to linger here. Karen, I think we've got a lot of questions that have come in. I will turn it to you to help me sort through those. Oh, <clears throat> we've had a lot of really nice discussion um, and comments, not so many questions. Um, let me see if I can parse one of them. There were a number of questions, uh, um, I think, related to your graphs, uh, Matt, for Galveston and Kit. Kittleson, uh, I'm Galveston, I'm sorry, Galveston in Colorado, shouldn't read and talk at the same time. Um, whether, how, how much those were related to uh, school drop-offs and, and, and I think you answered those. Um, how much of the daily peak decrease is related to school trips? Well, yeah, just, I think it, schools is, no, is not inconsequential. I mean, when we, when we typically do traffic counts, school being in session or out of session is, is not something that's subtle in terms of the demand on the system. It's, it's profound. We, in, in Bend, it's, it's often, I would consider it more normal than the summer peaks. Sometimes that's different in different communities. The summer without school goes down. Obviously we have a different scenario here, but the takeaway is that school is a fundamental part of how people get around with dropping kids off. So without it, and this, I, I guess it, it reiterates the point I just make is we can't really identify normal without school being back to whatever it's going to be. So we need to get school back in session and understand it. Um, um, but how much is it affecting things? I think the, the morning, it's probably pretty profoundly impacting it. Uh, my anecdote is I live down Brookswood and there's been uh, last year pretty significant peaking as people were dropping off kids at school. This year, there is no peaking. It's completely gone. So I think in some ways that could hide problems <clears throat> that we already know are there. In other ways, it may um, it may change people's decisions going forward. So we may we may have a different situation when we come out of it. We need to be ready to learn from it for sure. And one person commented that this might be an opportunity to change people some people's habits for um, getting their kids to school to encourage some mode shifting. Um, one person was curious about if you thought the traffic data would differ from weekends to weekdays and under current circumstances. 
Um, I think it undoubtedly would. I'll answer locally, and then Jorge, I'd be curious if you have any information that you've seen nationally or not. Uh, I m my takeaway is that all trips are different. I mean, just my daily patterns is we've um, we've tried to when we do go out. Um, I'll give you an example of we have kids have swim lessons on Wednesday night, and that also happens to be when we do a lot of our shopping because we're already out. We used to do that on the weekend, so I think people are changing their patterns of when they're linking trips together or not. If you're going out, you might as well get a lot of stuff done. So I don't have a data. We could actually go pull the data. I know um, Hobie has some of that stuff, but we haven't, I haven't pulled it specific because I don't have an exact answer. But my, my assumption would be that the weekend's probably just as different as the weekday. Yeah, my memory of Hobie's data was that our uh, school, the volumes traffic that we get with school are higher than our summer peaks. Um, which is really hard to believe because we have some pretty awesome summer peaks. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, there was a question about plans being considered for east-west safe travel of cyclists and pedestrians. I think I'll answer that person offline because that has to do with the TSP more than your presentation. Um, well, I do think just um, maybe from a high level you know, the opportunities that are out there with, with this mode shift we may see, I think it is important to note that the city has been planning east-west travel for people walking and biking. There are, there are projects, you know, as I mentioned, a robust network for people walking and biking, whether they be trails or infrastructure on the system or on the, on the roadways themselves. Um, there's also been some crossings of the parkway. How do we get people over the parkway more efficiently um, in the midtown area? So the bond presents opportunities to implement those. That's a big part of the bond for those that dug into it. Um, but there, there certainly is the plan and resources um, in, out there to, to accomplish some pretty significant east-west improvements for walking and biking. Yeah, and several people have commented this, this may be the time sooner rather than later. Um, so here's a question. With more people telecommuting, what do you think are the implications for um, planning transportation in conjunction with land use. Suddenly lots of people live very close to where they work, like down the hall. <laughs> so I think the question is, are there implications for our land use planning as well as transportation planning? Um, and I would say absolutely. certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the good news there, and Karen is very, very familiar with this, and I think a lot of people on this call are, are, are familiar as well, is the state of Oregon almost requires it. Um, so Bend has been doing it for a while. The, the recent urban growth boundary expansion definitely um, focused on the land use and transportation link. They developed an integrated land use and transportation plan even that's now incorporated into the, the transportation system plan and other, other key documents for the city. Um, so that's definitely true here. Jorge, I'm curious um, if you're seeing more, Jorge is in um, Orlando, so there's a, a little bit of a different context on the planning side of things, but I'd be curious your, what you're seeing in your neck of the woods. Yeah, so we definitely don't have the same level of land use regulations that you just mentioned. Um, but uh, we have been studying telecommuting, telecommuting for a project down in Miami. And so this is all based on pre-COVID-19 lit review. And the, um, the literature for telecommuting prior to COVID-19 was a pretty mixed bag, uh, even though it reduces the miles people travel to go to work. It, it, it was found to have this second order effect where people kept moving, you know, picking their housing further and further away from their work at, you know, mostly in locations where uh, multimodal options were pretty lacking. And so they ended up overall uh, do, uh, driving more vehicle miles than in their pre-telecommuting version. So, um, you know, COVID-19 has changed a lot of things. So maybe that's one of the things that have changed. Um, but as we talked about with our clients, we really emphasize the need for, for those land use plans to go along with any encouragement of telecommuting. Uh, someone asked the uh, question about whether the city used LOS or VMT thresholds. And I think that the question is, it depends. I mean, the answer is it depends on what we're measuring. 
we use VMT thresholds to measure how well we're doing with our land use planning. Um, so related to what Jorge just said, we do still use level of service for uh, intersection analysis, right, Matt? Yeah, it's really true, mostly related to the development code. There's still, when you're looking at, does the system work with, infra with uh, infrastructure uh, or uh, new development going in, there's still um, level of service, volume of capacity, we can go really deep engineering nerdy on you, but they still intersection specific measures but as Cameron was saying, um, there's, a, there's a lot of movement in Oregon and other places to look more broadly at how we're affecting the overall system as we're looking at planning documents. Um, so the UGB and the TSP are some of those and the, and the MPO regularly uses those measures um, for their own reporting as well. So there's a lot of great data out there on what's happening in Bend. Um, and a couple of people have raised the issue of equity um, related to what we were talking about. They weren't really asking questions, just making an observation, but um, that that increased uh, dependency on a, on a privately owned automobile is is essentially an equity issue. Yeah, and the, the equity one is a, is a big one, even um, you know, evolving over the, over in my thought at least, over the last couple of weeks and months as we've thought about this, you know, the we like to dive into data and look at how are the traffic volumes changing and are we seeing more people walking and biking? But I think the equity part of this is really important as people have highlighted and something we need to keep track of because the, the needs are different for different types of people. The unemployment uh, data um, that, that from the sources that Jorge was looking at were shocking. You know, I think anyone looking at those sees a disparity. And so we really, I think there's more work to, that's needed to dig into really what, what is the outcome. We're not done yet understanding as we've said a couple of times. So keeping a, an eye on that is gonna be really important. Learning from it and understanding it is gonna be important um, and something that could be increasingly profound as we go through this. Someone else mentioned the fact that the, uh, there is a fair number of retired people in, in Bend and wondering if that affected the fact that those folks wouldn't be traveling to a job anyway. Does that, does that affect uh, any of our, our uh, analysis? Definitely part of it. It's already part of it. I think, you know, Ben's travel patterns are pretty unique because of all those elements, the work from home, the high, high number of people that just retire here and, 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 and spend their leisure time here. So we do have different peaks and valleys and, and patterns in a lot of places. We're not anywhere near typical. So we may be the same as we, as we come out of this pandemic, we may be increasingly different. I think that's that's pretty much all the questions I have seen so far, unless someone else has something they want to type up. Well, this has been great. It's good questions and discussions. Um, we appreciate the chance to, to share. We think about these things a lot, so it's nice to have an audience of people that want to hear about it. My wife is tired of me talking about it, so it's good to get an outlet somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah, and I think we should do this again in a year. <laughs> we'll know a lot more, we'll know different things. Um, I would be rem remiss if I didn't correct an earlier error I made when I gave credit to a firm called Pinnacle Engineering, which doesn't exactly exist. It's Pinnacle Architects, and my apologies. <laughs> I had engineering on the brain as our sponsor. Well, with that, I think uh, there are no more questions. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for taking some time out of your day and listening to us uh, walk out on transportation issues and um, stay in touch. We will uh, be back with you with more interesting discussions. And if anyone is really curious about a topic and has an idea for a lecture, please get in touch with us. We're always looking for that kind of um, community thinking. So I think, um, Valerie, I think we can call this a wrap.